Well, good morning, church. It's so good to be here. I love you guys. This is such an awesome time to be with our family this morning. Um, before we dive into the word this morning, I just want to thank Pastor Jeremiah, Pastor Bianca, uh, for giving me, the, giving me the opportunity to share God's word uh, this morning. You know, people ask me from time to time, they say, what is, what is it like working and serving at Living Water? And I say, let me tell you, the first thing I usually tell them, I said, my pastors, they are constantly encouraging me. And that's what, I, how many have been encouraged by our, our pastor, amen? They're, they're always encouraged. We just thank you guys so much. Well, my name is Pastor Johnny. I'm the kids pastor here. And on Sunday, on Sunday, you normally find me in kids' church. Um, just, I just wanted, I made a couple notes to remind myself this morning not to do quiet seat prizes or do any puppet voices this morning. I'm not going to do anything like that. So, But let's go ahead and get started. We're going to turn to Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 through 19. And the writer of Proverbs, he... Uh, it's most likely Solomon here. He starts with the poetic device, and they would say that there are six things. How many read that in the Bible? You need to see that. There are six things. No, there are seven things. And the writers knew that there were seven things. Is this a way to draw the reader's attention? So um, let's turn to Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. It says, there are six things that the Lord hates. Seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that make haste to run to evil. A false witness who breathes out lies. And one who sows discord among brothers. The title of my message this morning is The Seven Things God Hates. Let's pray. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much. We just thank you for bringing us together here in your house, Lord. We just love you. We worship you, God. I pray as we open up your word, God, and discover what you have for us this morning, that you would just speak to everyone's heart in here. Speak to me. Speak through me, Lord. God, we just thank you for what you're doing in this house. And I just thank you so much for uh, everything that you do, God. And we just thank you. Give everything to you for your glory, for your honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, my wife and I and my son, Aaron, we went to uh, Chicago this summer. And it was in July. We went down to Navy Pier. And they had firework night. It was a great night. We we're on the Ferris wheel. The fireworks are going off. We were just like barely made it. And it was, it was such a beautiful evening. We walk around the city. We had some amazing food. I even found great parking, which is like, and it was really cheap. And I was like, wow, this is like, so that day we were just like, we were coming home. We we're on the expressway. Mom, 55, you know how it starts off with traffic for a little bit. And then we started, we started moving pretty good. And then we were moving really good. And so we were in the left lane and my wife and I, we're in like a deep conversation. I don't know what we were talking about, but we were in a deep conversation and I'm in the left lane and I'm not driving as fast. Let me tell you, it's like illegal to be like chilling in the left lane, right? You can't be doing that, not in Chicago. I know better. I know these people, right? But I became one of these people. And before you know it, there was someone riding, riding me, like right on the tail, just right on in the back of us. And we're just like, I was like, oh no, I, I gotta get out of the way. I became one of these people. So before I can even turn my right turning signal on to get in the middle lane, this person, they were revving up their car and they, and they, they had a nice, nice car. It was super fast. And they just zipped past me. They were like, just the loud roar of their engine. And not only did they go around me, but now there's a car in front of them. Their decision is to cut me off. And I'm like, oh no. So, you know, at first I was like, maybe my Toyota got it. No, my little Toyota Camry's not fast. My Toyota Camry's not fast at all. And before you know it, I'm like, I, I got nothing. This car's got nothing. 
And um, so I hit my brakes real hard. And as I hit my brakes real hard, my son in the back, he hits his head against the, the door. And so this car, it, mind you, it's flying, speeding. And he cuts me off really good. He just missed us. But now, as he went so fast, now he's turned his wheel just a little bit to overcorrect. And now we're all like the people that had watched him cut me off. We're all just watching this guy. He went to the right. Now he's swerving back to the left. And before you know it, he's like, we're like, oh, he's going to crash. This is going to be bad. There's tire, you know, smoke and everything. But he just pulls it off just in time before he goes off to the, into the ditch. And if that was me, I would pull over. I would say, thank you, Lord. You know, I lived another day. I thank you so much. But this person didn't do that. I don't know who it was. I didn't even get to look. I don't know if it was a, a teenager, an older man, or a grandpa or grandma. I don't know. I have no clue. But this, this driver, after that happened, they sped. It's like it didn't even bother them. They sped. They went across all the lanes, and they just started cutting people off left and right. And you can see people, there might be sermons today talking about, you know, like this person cut me off. There might be a couple of those, but they, they just, they were gone. They were gone within seconds, bright lights everywhere. And so later on, I couldn't help but think how his, uh, this person, this driver's actions were not just dangerous, but they were outright foolish. You know, it made me reflect on how One's person, like a person that could be so selfish and, and disregard for others, how it can cause so much chaos, how it can cause so much harm. And you know, that driver's, that recklessness and nearly led to disaster, not just for him, but for everyone around him. And so in many ways, this driver's actions, they mirror the things that God warns us about in scripture. Just like that driver who almost lost control and caused a wreck, there are things in our lives that if left unchecked, they can spin out of control and they can lead us and those around us into destruction. So today we're gonna learn about the seven things that God hates and why he hates them so that our lives don't spin out of control. So we're gonna, we're gonna dive, dig, we're gonna dig into each one of these uh, scriptures this morning, the things that God hates. And so we're not pointing fingers this morning, okay? Just so you know, we're not pointing fingers. Let me tell you, the Holy Spirit, he's our teacher. And the way he often works is he, he lovingly taps on our shoulders, right? And he warns us about the roads we shouldn't go down. So the Holy Spirit, if he's nudging you today, this morning, if he's nudging you, please respond to him today. Allow him to teach you a better way, a life that's pleasing to God. So some people, they think that, you know, God couldn't hate. He can't hate anything, but he is a God of love, amen? And we know he is a God of love, but just like a parent loves their child, and hates anything that harms them. You know, God is a God of love and he hates evil. So loving what is good, it, it means hating what's evil. It, it means hating what's harmful. So let's dig into the seven things that God hates. So the first thing that we talked about, first thing that we read is God hates. He hates haughty eyes. But what exactly are haughty eyes? You know, the scripture, it refers to a proud or arrogant look. It's an attitude of superiority that shows how we view and how we treat others. It's a person with, a person with haughty eyes, they, they look down on others. They're thinking that they're better, that they're more important, or they're more worthy of respect. And so there's a lot of dangers. There's a lot of dangers with pride. You know, pride is, is at the root of haughty eyes. And, and the Bible repeatedly warns against it. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, it says, pride goes before destruction 
and a haughty spirit before a fall. So this verse, it highlights the dangers of pride. It, it leads us to a downfall. It leads us to destruction. So when we allow pride to take root in our hearts, it distorts our view of ourselves and it distorts our view of others. And we start to, we start to elevate ourselves above others, you know, believing that we deserve more honor, we deserve more respect or privilege. And that, uh, that not only dis, just damages uh, our relationships with people, but it separates us from God. So when, uh, one time, when I was a kid, my older sister, Amy, she had a way of like keeping us grounded, okay? She, anytime we'd start bragging, we might say something like, you know, I'm better than you. I can run faster than you. You know, during Halloween, I'm like, I got more candy than you did. Where's your candy? Oh, you only got sweet tarts? <laughs> you know? And my, my, my sister, Amy, she would always step in and she'd say, you know, the, the Bible says pride comes before the fall. And, and it was just, it was her way to remind us that whenever we puffed up ourselves, that, that, that we, were, we were setting ourselves up for a fall. And so as adults, this lesson from God's word is still true. In our marriages, pride, it can stop us from admitting that we're wrong, right? At work, it, it could keep us, it could keep us from, uh, you know, saying like, you know what, I, can, I could do it. I could do it. You know, it can keep us from asking for help. Does that happen at work for you sometimes? And you know, it's just a reminder. It may be in school or any other area. It pride, it makes us think that we're better than other people. So we gotta be careful with pride. So in contrast, the Bible consistently teaches humility, right? James 4, 6, it tells us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So when we have haughty eyes, we position ourselves against God and we, ad we adopt an attitude that's contrary to him. The second thing that God hates, God hates, he hates a lying tongue. And, and a lying tongue is, whew, a lying tongue is someone who knowingly and willingly speaks falsehoods to deceive others. And there's a lot of danger in lying. You know, lying, lies, they break trust between people. Have you ever like told a lie to a friend and they found out? It doesn't go so well, does it? It hurts, it, it, it hurts people. And it breaks that trust between people. You know, lying can, it could lead to further sin too. There's so many times that if we lie, we gotta find ourselves uh, covering up that lie with another lie and then another lie. And before you know it, they ask you later and you're like, I don't know what lie I'm on. What, what lie am I on? I'm on lie number five. Well, just give me a hint. Just give me just something. Can I get a hint? I forgot. But lying, it goes against God and it, it pushes us away from him. So what should we do instead? Well, we should tell the truth, right? And God loves honesty. In Proverbs chapter 12, 22, it says, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. So just think about that. When we act faithfully, it is his delight. How precious is that? The third thing that God hates, God hates hands that shed innocent blood. You know, this scripture, it refers to murder. It speaks of those who take away the lives of innocent people. And you might be thinking, you know, this is something I don't deal with. Let's go to the next one. But I have, you might be saying, you know, I've never murdered anybody, okay? And I'm pretty sure I don't plan on doing that. You know, every, every life is a gift from God. It is. And so you might say, hold up, you know, I know some people that are not a gift at all, okay? You might say that. But when we receive a gift from Christmas, right, from a loved one, 
What do we do? We take care of it. You ever get a gift so well, you, you, just get, you just take care of it. But that's how we should be, that's how we need to view other people, right? We can't view others as trash or no good or a waste of space, right? No, we need to treat other people like they are valuable and, how, and that they're important to us. Because every life is a gift from God. So when we get angry and upset about something that someone else does, we need to step back and, and think for a second. We need to remember in that moment that God made that person, right? And we must value his or her life. Then instead of, of just allowing our anger to keep growing out of control, we need to forgive them. But you might say, you know, I'm not gonna murder them but I don't want to forgive them. Well, listen to what Jesus had to say about forgiveness and murder. In Matthew chapter five, verse 21 through 22, it says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Powerful. In other words, if if you let anger take control of you and you don't forgive someone, it's the same as murder. And so Jesus, he takes forgiveness very seriously. The fourth thing that God hates. There's more, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but there's true. It helps us. God is helping us and, and correcting us. So the fourth thing that God hates. God hates a heart that devises wicked plans. This sin, it involves plotting evil or harboring harmful intentions. You know, God hates a heart that devises wicked plans. It's when we allow our thoughts to dwell on how we can get back at someone who has wronged us. We've all been there before, right? Someone hurts us and our first instinct to think is, how can I make them pay for this? Maybe it's a coworker who undermined us and you start plotting ways to make them look bad in return. Or perhaps it's a friend who betrayed us. We begin to consider how we can get even. You know, but this kind of thinking, it leads us down a dark path. Proverbs 51.10, it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So when we come up with wicked plans, we should pray that God would renew our thoughts In our minds. Proverbs 4 23, it says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. You know, the heart, it represents the center of our being, it's the source of our desire and decision. We must not allow anything to come into or flow out of our hearts that's not pleasing to God and helpful for spiritual growth. We need to guard what we watch. We need to guard what we listen to. We need to guard what we read. We need to guard what we talk about. Because all these senses, there are images and ideas that, that root themselves in our hearts. And they affect the type of people that we become. So guard your heart. Keep yourself from making evil plans. We should plan to do good things, right? Amen. Number five, the fifth thing that God hates. God hates feet that make haste to run to evil. It's talking about feet that are quick to rush into evil. It means people who are quick to jump into doing wrong things instead of thinking what is right what they do is they they hurry to do something evil. 
And God hates this because it, it shows a heart that is eager and ready to sin. And one commenter put it this way, he says, the, the heart blazes the trail that the feet will follow. I thought that was really good. But Isaiah, he puts it like this in Isaiah 59, chapter seven. He says, their feet run to evil and they are swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, desolation and destruction are in their highways. Listen, there is a lot of evil to run towards here, isn't it, in this world, right? There's a lot of evil to run to. You know, if, if an armored truck on 55 again, if an armored truck was driving and flipped over and money started coming out the back, would we all run to get, you know, would we be running to get some money that's coming down? Some of you be like, I'm gonna pay off that parking lot. I'm gonna pay, <laughs> we're gonna get that parking lot paid for. Wait a minute, my kids need braces. Hold on, they need braces. <laughs> but we shouldn't run to evil. We shouldn't, our feet should be directed towards God, amen? Proverbs 18, 10, it says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. Amen. That's where we should be running. God is the one we should be running to. He's the one that's gonna protect us. We should be running to the Lord and not running to evil. The sixth thing that God hates, God hates, a false witness who breathes out lies. God mentions twice that he hates lies in this passage. That must mean he really hates lies, right? The first was a lying tongue. Now the second one, it goes even further. He hates a false witness who spreads lies. This is lying by telling false stories about others to cause harm. You know, it can happen in court or it can happen in the court of public opinion, like on social media. You know, there was a woman, she contacted a pressure washing company uh, to get her driveway cleaned. And after receiving a quote and agreeing to a price, she later asked if they can also pressure wash her back patio. So the company said that they could they can do it and explain that it would cost extra. And so she agreed to the new price and she signed a contract for the additional work. However, after the job was completed, she claimed she never agreed to the extra charges and she began leaving bad reviews on social media. And so in her review, she accused the company of overcharging her and being dishonest even though she had signed a contract for the additional service. So the false review, it threatened to damage the company's reputation despite having done everything by the book. So here's the thing. Lies are the opposite of Jesus, amen? And in John 14, six, it says, Jesus told his disciples, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus, he is the truth. Everything about him is true. Everything that he says is true. And that's why it's so, impo that's why it's so important that his followers don't lie. These lies, they can ruin lives. They can cause so much harm. The seventh thing that God hates, last thing that God hates here, just in this passage, he hates Many other things too. Don't think, oh, just I gotta cover these seven. We're good, right? God hates a lot of lies. There's a lot of lies. And uh, he hates a lot of uh, things in the Bible. So um, the last thing that God hates is one who sows discord among brothers. Here's a person who causes trouble, stirs up conflict everywhere. You know, it happens in politics. It happens at work, it happens in communities, it happens even at church. 
And this person, they create problems by planting seeds of doubt, spreading rumors, gossiping, complaining. And their actions, they they lead to division and disunity. So watch out for gossipers. You know, be careful around people who say things like, I don't know if it's true. I, I, I just thought you should know so you could pray. Be careful around these people. These people are not concerned with helping at all. They just want to cause harm. And the best thing you can do is stand firm and tell them, you know what? I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. You know, we live in a world that can spread discord so far, so fast. You know, God sees those who try to create conflict. He sees that. Don't be counted among them. You know, the apostle Paul, he warned the churches about the dangers of division. He he encouraged them to to be united in one accord. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, it says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. You know, recently, a church member they donated a boxes of Beanie Babies. And if you don't know what Beanie Babies are, they're like from the 90s. They're this cute, they're the cutest like little teddy bears. And I, I don't know if you know, but like Beanie Babies are really in right now. They are really, in. anything from the 90s is really in right now. So they donated these Beanie Babies. Um, her son had an eBay store and he just had boxes and boxes of Beanie Babies. Um, we soon realized that we had a small problem on our hands. There are way too many Beanie Babies. We had too many of them. So my leaders, they came up to me and they said, Pastor Johnny, we got to do something with all of these Beanie Babies. So we came up with an idea. I said, why, why, why don't we just use them to help kids learn scripture? So we decided that if the kids can come up and tell us the memory verse from the previous week that they can pick out a Beanie Baby. And it's awesome. Praise God. So sure enough, kids would come up and they'd say these long memory verses they've been learning all week. And we're just like, wow, I don't even know that one. Good job. (laughs) That's good. Well, one week, the verse was really simple. It was really simple. It's Mark eleven twenty two, and it's have faith in God. And sure enough, the kids were excited. They ran up that week and they're like, have faith in God, Mark eleven twenty two. And I noticed a lot of kids started getting a, a bunch of Beanie Babies. And I was like, and I, you know, I was like, oh no, we're gonna run out of these Beanie Babies. <laughs> but, you know, some of the kids who hadn't learned the verse yet, they maybe weren't there for that week. You know, the kids were telling them like, hey, it's Mark eleven twenty two. have faith in God. So all of a sudden, like, there's more kids coming. I'm like, okay. They, tell every, they were telling everybody. And at first, I thought to myself, you know, they didn't practice this throughout the week. I shouldn't allow this. But then the Lord, he corrected my heart he showed me the beauty in what was happening these children weren't these these children they were they were planting God's word they were planting God's word in each other's hearts they were whispering his truth they were whispering have faith in God that's precious that's what we should all be doing we should be sowing God's word into each other. Amen. Just like those children. Amen. You know, just like those children were sharing the memory verse with each other, we should be sharing God's love and his truth with those around us. What a beautiful thing to see. Let's sow God's word with one another. You know, as 
we come to the end of today's message on the seven things that God hates. I believe God has spoken to many of our hearts today. Maybe you realize something on this list is maybe some of these things have been a, a struggle for you. Maybe it's haughty eyes. Maybe it's a lying tongue. Or maybe you've been devising wicked plans. Whatever it is today, today is the day to make things right with God. So I wanna pray with you for a moment. Would you just bow your heads? Would you close your eyes this morning? Just take a moment to reflect on what's been said this morning. You know, maybe you're here today. Maybe you've been watching online. Maybe you're here this morning. You're not saved. You don't know that if you died today that you'd be in heaven or that you'd be in hell. Did you know that God, he, he wants you to know. God wants you to be a 100% sure that if you die today, that you would be with him. You know, the Bible says that all have sinned and broken God's law. We've all done it. We've all done our own thing and we've gone against what God wanted for our lives. And we deserve to be punished for our sins. But that's not what we receive. What we receive is an amazing act of grace. Jesus, God's son, he came and he died on the cross to pay the price for our sins. Now, instead of punishment, sadness, we have the chance to receive forgiveness and joy. So how do we get that amazing forgiveness and joy? We simply ask God, to forgive us of our sins. We accept that responsibility for our actions. And then we receive God's grace. That's it. Just ask and receive. God, he loves you and he's ready to give it to you. Not only to you, but to everyone. He loves the whole world the same. There's no one that's too far away from God to be changed. No one that's too far away from God that to be changed by his love. So if you're here today, say, Pastor Johnny, you know, I need to be saved from my sins. I wanna start following God today. If you're here today and you say, I wanna, I wanna pray and I wanna ask God to forgive me of all unrighteousness. I want you to lift your hand up this morning. On the count of three, one, two, three. You say, that's me, I wanna follow Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can put your hands back down. Can we just pray this prayer out loud after me? Let's all repeat it so we can encourage those who may be praying this for the first time. Say, Dear Jesus, I know that I've sinned and I've done wrong things, but I know that you love me. I believe you are the Son of God and that you died on the cross and defeated death. To save me from my sins, please come into my heart, forgive me of my sins, and help me live for you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Celebrate what the Lord is doing, amen. Listen.